platforms is going to be exploring the theme of disinformation, fakery, and the real problems of truth. So we're going to be doing a double hander in this session. So I'm here in person, but Mariana is going to be a digital presence and you know, with a distinctive synergy is in fact going to be talking about digital, the modern digital, political, global impacts of this and the witch-running going up to, prior to an election. Whereas I'm focusing on the very local and what I've called with a significant question mark, um, the problem of Samuel Johnson's real deal, deal desk. And here, in fact, I'm thinking about whether Pembroke has been keeping the true Johnsonian flame alive in the Johnson desk as Victorian, you know, as, as a kind of relic of what the Pembroke history des uh, describes as Pembroke's most famous son. Or, as the BBC recently broke about this story, is it really, you know, a knackered old fake, which is a bit of a problem? Has Pembroke unwittingly then been participating in a Victorian scam since 1867, uh, the date when the desk first came to Pembroke, as well as a scam, as you'll see, which in the previous decade might then also have involved Charles Dickens, Thomas Carlyle, John Forster, the future biography of Dickens, not to mention the Prime Minister, William Thackeray, the Bishop of Oxford, among a host of other Victorian worthies. So we're starting small then, a, a desk, a college, a celebrated literary alumnus, and we're ending with Mariana on some very big questions indeed. And of course, we're going to be very lucky to get Mariana here today um, talking about these things, given the amount of work she's got. So, uh, right. And in fact, but we do have a link because it's about voting and elections and we're going to be voting you know, in some ways about this desk as well. What do we really think about it? So, OK, so in this first session, then local, we're going to be moving in a fairly narrow, if at times quite murky orbit between central London, Oxford and the rather less than salubrious environs of Victorian Deptford. And in all these locations, the Johnson desk, or Johnson desk, um, will be our centerpiece. A historic artifact then, whatever we think of it, uh, and which as this brass plaque that was permanently affixed to the desk in 1867 by the college affirms, um, you know, gives its little story here, literally written in brass on the desk. It's kind of like an ornate bit of Victorian graffiti, really. Uh, and it records this history whereby Pembroke was given the Johnson desk then by the magnificently named Augustus Carr Bozzi Granville. So the clerk on one hand then can seem to offer us um, this sense of inviolable and incontrovertible certainty not only in its permanence and literal immovability, there's no way of getting that plot off that desk, actually. So we are, that is what it is, actually. We know the provenance of the plot, absolutely, definitely. But first, as this plot importantly proclaims then, this is the desk, it says, as actual Johnsonian relic, uh, presenting us then with a material history and a provenance that takes us, it says, right back to Johnson himself. And importantly, in the really talismanic form of the writer's desk, the site of creation. So, and secondly, and even more importantly, of course, as the clock tells us, that this is the desk on which Samuel Johnson wrote his famous dictionary, at which he finished in 1755. So whether this literally brazen certainty holds up, and where it came from and how we might interpret it then is the theme of my talk today. So, okay then, first of all, some history. So since we are in this bit of, my, of this session today in a definitely pre-digital era, we're going to go on a little paper trail now. We're going to have to rely on written records entirely, but we can use these to give us three important snapshots. So first, a snapshot of Johnson himself and his desk working away in Gough Square in London 
and in the location of the dictionary garret between 1747 and 1755. And here we have the, the dictionary garret still there, okay, still in Goff Square, okay, it's much, much tidier now and cleaner than it would have been in Johnson's day, okay, so, um, and um, the second snapshot of um, the desk will be its surprising reappearance in Deptford in 1855 in the impoverished hands of Anne Lowe, one of Johnson's godchildren. But note these dates, okay? She's born some 25 years after Johnson was busy in Gough Square, and she was, as the will, also still in Gough Square. Uh, notes left a monetary bequest, but she definitely wasn't left a desk. Okay, and our third snapshot we'll be looking at today is going to be looking at some of the other problems in the paper trail of desk, dictionary, and possible deceit on its way to Pembroke then. So, first of all then, was there a desk? I mean, is there even a desk in this story? Was there a dictionary desk at all? Here though, uh, this is good. Okay, first we definitely know that there is a desk. Johnson offers his own certainties, as you can see in this bit of my slide, uh, the, on the second half there, uh, where he says that actually, you know, in, if you're going to write a dictionary, you've absolutely got to have a desk. If you want to be a poet, you can walk in the field, that's fine. You can stay in bed, but if you're going to write a dictionary, a desk is an essential element, okay? So a desk is non-negotiable, okay, in the matter of lexicography. Even better, though, in terms of Johnson's own dictionary making, we can identify a specific desk. Okay, as in these bits here. So, not a very good desk, I have to say, according to a range of Garrett visitors, okay, but a dictionary desk nevertheless. So, in these contemporary accounts of people coming to Gough Square and wandering up to the Garrett while Johnson's making the desk, and we've got the artist Joshua Reynolds, and uh, we've also got Charles Burney, uh, the novelist Fanny Burney's father, both of them wandering up then, you know, to see a deal writing desk, yeah, or as Reynolds says, an old crazy deal table, you know, and a still worse, an older elbow chair with only three legs, you see. So um, Johnson is not a rich man at this particular point in time. He's going to be arrested for debt almost, well, twice at this point, saved once by the novelist Samuel Richardson, who lends him the money to stop. So he's not a rich man. We're not expecting a, a desk of great quality or great material value. Okay, so this is not an inlaid or an ornate desk at all, made of expensive hardwood, etc., etc. But instead, it's a desk that's made of deal. Okay, which is the cheapest possible wood. Okay, so deal the wood of pine, says Johnson in his dictionary. So, um, um, so that's that's what it's made of. So, um, you know, cheapest wood possible. Not a great desk at all. Uh, and in fact, when um, John, when Reynolds later decides to paint. Uh, dictionary Johnson here in 1756 after the dictionary is finished and uh, you can see that he's put some nice um, ornate copies of the dictionary behind him to sort of celebrate this. We might also note that we, we actually start our little story of strategic fakery because the desk is handily covered with a green cloth, actually, to disguise just how bad it is. And Johnson is also, as another bit of fakery, given a much more comfortable and stable chair, you see. So, so these are all good things, and we can start to see how stories change and build up through the year. In fact, that he keeps going back to this painting, and as Johnson accrues in stature, um, he gets older and older in the painting. He acquires more and more quill pens and pots and, you know, and all sorts of things around him as the paraphernalia of the great writer is built up. So there's some quite interesting disconnects between the real desk and, and even this is a kind of visual narrative of the story. But anyway, this does give us then the beginning of our desk story in mid 18th century London as Johnson here with his dictionary assistants in the garret, who probably had their own desks. In fact, there would be multiple garret desks on another, you know, is this another problem for my story? Um, also, it's all working together to slowly bring this dictionary into being. 
but Johnson will then leave Gough Square four years after the first edition is complete, so we know the dictionary is finished in 1755. Um, he's going to leave the house, Gough Square, in 1759 because he can't afford the rent anymore. The dictionary's been paying the rent. Without the dictionary, he's really struggling here. And he's moving somewhere much, much, much smaller, which also means there's no way he can take everything with him from the five stories of Gough Square. So, if he can't take anything, does the desk stay or go? As a deal desk, it's really light. It would be easy to carry, even down these 60 odd steps, very narrow, all the way down from the garret. Um, but our paper trail at this point goes absolutely cold for almost a century. The desk disappears from public history. Okay, story two. This is where it gets much more interesting or messy, depending on your point of view. So for almost 100 years, we hear absolutely nothing of a dictionary desk. Then suddenly, in the space of a month, we get two key sightings. Okay, so one is uh, this one um, in the Leicestershire Mercury, no less, in May 1855, where, as we are told, the desk on which Samuel Johnson definitely wrote the whole of his grand dictionary can be found in five Minerva Place in Deptford. Who knew? You know, um, being looked after by Samuel Johnson's goddaughter, Anne Lowe, and her sister Frances, and more to the point, for a donation, folks, you can even go and see it, along with some other Johnsonian artifacts in their possession, including an extra desk, just in case, okay? So, uh, so you know, you can afford them, says the Lecture of Mercury, an easy opportunity, there you are, alleviate the penury, go and see a desk, make a donation, you know, what's not to like, okay? So, very interesting. But the other sighting, we might argue, is even better. And this is courtesy of a series of letters, now in the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, that Anne Lowe sent directly to the writer Thomas Carlyle, stating three things. First, that Anne was now the last living link to Johnson, complete with memories of sitting on his knee. Okay. Second, that she has the desk. Okay. And third, that she and her sister were in acute want. Um, in fact, in the Leicestershire Mercury article, uh, there's a little note saying that she's had a patron who's just died and she's looking for another one. So there's a, a little bit of strategic selection, we might argue, going on here. Because Carlyle is a Johnson enthusiast of the First Order in his heroes and hero worship. Johnson has played a prime role. Carlyle's also been very active in a number of charitable campaigns to raise money for literary descendants. So, um, as a result, it's a good choice. Anne writes then to Carlyle on the anniversary of the publication of Johnson's Dictionary. So, April 8, 1755, April 1855, she writes to Carlyle and Carlyle immediately springs into action. Something must be done, he tells his sister. You know, and what the something is, is he immediately co-ops his close friend, Charles Dickens, very handy to have Charles Dickens as your close friend, and John Forster, and these together send a letter to the Prime Minister, Palmerston, to ask for charity from the Royal Literary Fund. And when this fails, because Palmerston says, yeah, it's a good story, but that link between Johnson and the goddaughter is, is too remote. I can't do this, but he does give them a hundred pounds just in case. Okay, but when the, the actual formal appeal fails, then in fact Johnson um, Johnson's uh, goddaughter story moves mainstream. Charles Dickens and Carlyle and Forster launch a major public appeal in the press in November 1855 with the aim of raising money to secure the future of the sisters and of course to secure the future of the desk. So this gives us our biggest and most widespread paper trail. Carlyle goes to Deptford to visit the sisters, um, so does his wife, she gets her feet wet, she's not pleased. Um, so uh, the pauper desk gains public prominence and a kind of Victorian celebrity 
appearing across this national and international campaign as a kind of eloquent symbol of Johnson himself and his humble beginnings. So Carlyle says, well, the dictionary is like, you know, a cathedral, it's like St Paul's, but the Paul's per desk is where it all begins, actually. And meanwhile, the collective energies of um, a whole group of people, um, including Victoria and Pembroke, are all going to be brought together. So uh, to rescue these two old ladies who've turned up at Deptford, says Dickens, yeah, the last descendants of Samuel Johnson. Mr. Carlyle has found them in great poverty. You can see this, you know, he, uh, Dickens has just finished writing Hard Times. So this is like a real life Hard Times, you know, like, wow. He's writing, in fact, this letter is to Angela Bird of Coots, who's kind of like a big Victorian harass, this good one, she gives immediately £20 to start the fund off, you see. So, and they're undemonstrative, says Dickens, you see, uncomplaining, they're very old, and with nothing to speak of in the whole world, okay, except the plain fur desk on which Johnson wrote his English dictionary, you know, and you can see Carlyle here again, this is part of his draft, to uh, the Prime Minister saying, there in their little parlour in Deptford is the fur desk capable of being rigorously authenticated as such, upon which Samuel Johnson wrote the English dictionary, the best dictionary ever written, just to make sure. And this becomes the cornerstone, these letters are the cornerstone of this big public campaign, full of these emotional appeals about these deserve, this, you know, deserving gentlewomen with the link to Johnson and the pauper desk, which we can't forget in this story, okay? So, uh, and in fact, it does then, this is just a li little bit of the list of subscribers in the end, published in the Times in May 1856. And we can just see so many different people, ordinary people, think people who really liked um, Samuel Johnson, people who liked Carlyle, people who liked Dickens, you know, all decided they were going to kind of, you know, send little bits of money uh, to there. So we have, you know, so here's our I know, so stay here. There is our Pembroke group, okay, there, where we have a member of the foundation of Pembroke College, Oxford, and we gave her fiver. That was good, you see. So, so big spenders, you know. So that was that was a good one. So, so this is, you know, our, our happy ending, really. Anne and Francis get enough money from this to give a very healthy income for the rest of their lives. Um, the desk is also saved. So this is Anlo's terrible, terrible handwriting on the other half of my slide, saying that to Carlyle that he has to decide and to, to leave it to Carlyle as to what happened to the desk. And Carlyle's been getting all these interesting suggestions and people are like, well, let's sell it. Let's have a raffle, a desk raffle. That'll raise loads of money. And he was like, no, I don't like the idea of this. It's so sacred to the Johnsonian memory then. The desk, he decides, is going to stay in the little parlour in Deptford, you see. So that's good. So the desk is saved. The sisters are saved. They're not going to go to the workhouse. Um, all the furniture isn't going to be lost, etc., etc. And so on this level then, the campaign is a triumphant success. Okay, snapshot 2.5, I've snuck an extra one in. So, um, Anne Lowe dies, aged 82, in 1860. Her sister follows in 1866. And that heralds the return to our story of the still magnificently named Augustus Kerr, Bozzy Granville. Okay, now minister of the parish where the sisters were living and who unexpectedly becomes the next custodian of the desk. And then he, in an extraordinary act of generosity, as we've seen, rehomes the desk, contacting Pembroke College to suggest then, as Johnson's undergraduate home, this is where it truly belongs. So, so far, so good then. We had a deal desk in 1755. We've got a deal desk a century later in the parlour in Deptford. And by February of 1867, We've also got a deal desk sitting in the Pembroke Library 
at that point in Broadgate Hall, where we used to make these little postcards. This is a very early one from just before the First World War, where someone has written on the back where they've just been visiting Oxford, and this is the, the postcard they choose to send. So Oxford, Pembroke College, Dr. Johnson's desk, on which he wrote his dictionary. So uh, whether these are all the same desk, of course, is the real crux, okay? And this, I'm, I'm now going to introduce some real problems which were um, caused by another bit of the paper trail that I unexpectedly found earlier this year in the Wellington papers in the Southampton University archives, where in the 1820s, we suddenly encounter Anne Lowe again. Again, she's living with her sister Frances and now her mother Sarah too. And once more, the whole family is in poverty and in search of financial help. The begging letters she writes at this point are variously addressed to the King, the Prime Minister, or to Lady Liverpool, among lots of other ones. Lady Liverpool is the Prime Minister's wife and has her own separate fund for charity. In some of these letters, which are full of pathos, Dickens would love them, okay, Anne's mother has lost her sight after the sudden death of Anne's brother in 1821. In other letters, Anne's mother has lost the use of all her limbs as well. <laughs> So um, sometimes Anne has also acquired a whole set of her brother's children to look after, but then not in other ones, okay. But so the case for charity varies, but one aspect stays the same, that in their acute distress, everything has been sold. There is no mention or of Johnson, and crucially, there's no mention at all of a dictionary desk, but rather that, they have had to dispose of all their possessions. So, okay, where does this leave us? On one level, Anne is definitely lying to someone. Okay, fakery is at work. So, is she lying to the king and the prime minister in the 1820s, or to Carlisle and Dickens, the British public, the Bishop of Oxford, and by, by, by proxy, Pembroke too, 30 odd years later, both these stories can't be true. Has then the college carefully been cherishing a relic that didn't in reality exist? Or did Anne somehow save the desk from the financial ruin of the 1820s and tell the truth to Carlyle, even not if it wasn't, she wasn't telling the truth to George IV? So, uh, so is this then the real deal? Deal desk or just a deal desk? How are we to know? It's clearly real in that it has a material existence. You know, it definitely, it's definitely there. It's been in my office for the last year. I even go and pat it, you know. So it's definitely real, okay. But it's mainly not real in its alleged links to Johnson. There is, we should know, no logical reason why Anne should have a desk or even two. Johnson doesn't meet the Lowe family until 1769, so 10 years after he'd left Dock Square. All his furniture was left when he died in 1784 to his principal legatee, Francis Barber. But again, Barber knew the lows. Um, so a memento of Johnson in the form of a desk isn't entirely impossible. As of last week, the desk has now moved, or depending on your point of view, returned to the dictionary garret in Dock Square in London, so um, ready for the opening of a new exhibition curated by me and the curator of uh, Johnson's House and where visitors in a micro version of the election are going to have to vote on which version they prefer, having been provided with the case for the prosecution and for the defence. So true or false then, the real deal deal desk or just a deal desk? Is it, the, you know, do we have the sudden reappearance of the desk in 1855? Or do we have the disinformation of a desperate woman trying to save her family and herself? Or amid a story of familial loss and financial desperation, is this really still a memento of Johnson that was somehow retained across the years and now passed on to us? Or in other questions you might want to think about, were Carlyle, and Dickens and Forster, heroes or victims in this story. Here in a question we might send, extend to Victorian Pembroke too. 
and its own relationship to this kind of celebrity commodifying that was really going on around Samuel Johnson at this particular point in time. Now, which a whole range of artifacts. I think my favorite one is the crocodile bib holder that is also attached to Johnson, and that's in the Litchfield Museum. You know, so there's loads of things which we say are oh, Johnson's, um, <laughs> where um, the Johnsonian provenance may be more or less convincing. So, so in each case then, we just think with all these questions, the brass plaque offers us a certainty which might itself just be a carefully constructed story. But if you are in London over the next year, please come and have a look at the desk, see what you think about it and decide for yourself. But I mean, you know, just to go back to a little bit on one of my earlier slides, a relic, said Johnson in his dictionary, is something you keep in memory of someone else. So the diction, you know, the, the desk in that sense stays a relic, whether this is true of the emotional fidelity and the memory of Johnson, or material truth, but it's certainly a desk was definitely, definitely seen by Dickens, Carlyle, and which involved a whole range of Victorian worthies in the 1850s. Thank you. Okay, so through the wonders somehow of modern technology, we're going to now connect to Marianne, but I'm not doing that bit, so someone needs to. Oh, she's here. Yeah, that's good. Hi, Mariana. Passing over to you and sit down. Hello, can you hear me all right? Yes, very good. You can, good. Okay, perfect. Um, thank you so much. And I'm so sorry that um, I'm not there in person. Uh, if it were not for a general election in several days, I definitely would be. Um, but uh, anyway, I didn't anticipate this as much as everyone else. So um, I'm currently tied up investigating all things social media ahead of polling day. Um, and thank you so much for um, what was such an interesting talk just then and a real breather from a lot of the other stuff I've been looking at over the past few weeks. Um, when I was thinking about what this talk um, would focus on, particularly in terms of fakery and disinformation, but also the value of words, I was thinking quite a lot about uh, my time at Pembroke uh, not too long ago uh, studying languages, so French and ab initio Russian, um, and in some ways investigating the world of social media, particularly the harms, so disinformation, hate, algorithms, um, deep fakes, and so on, uh, and conspiracy theories too, has meant that I've had to learn a whole other language, <laughs> not just a language that involves words like misinformation and disinformation um, and stuff like that, but also then the kind of a lexicon um, that's employed by conspiracy theory activists very regularly now, so suggesting that something was staged or a hoax, that crisis actors uh, were involved, people were paid to take part in some way, um, or that, um, uh, that we're all sheeple, um, sheeple being the term that's used to describe anyone who uh, follows what they perceive to be the mainstream and doesn't believe conspiracy theories and so on. Um, and so perhaps it's worth kind of starting out by defining a little bit of, of, of a little bit of that language and also um, the what my job essentially is at the BBC. So um, I'm the BBC's first ever disinformation and social media correspondent. Um, it means that I spend a lot of time investigating uh, yeah, misinformation, disinformation, hate algorithms, and particularly focusing on their real world consequences. I do that for um, Radio 4, for, for podcasts quite quite a lot. I present the BBC's Americast podcast. Um, I appear frequently on Newscast, which is one of our, our other podcasts. I also work for BBC Panorama and BBC Three. So um, it's very busy and <laughs> has been very busy for the past um, few years. Um, and when I talk about conspiracy theories or disinformation, conspiracy theories in particular, um, I'm referring to, and I often investigate and deal in the most extreme examples, so those that are totally contrary to available evidence um, that suggest things that have happened never really did happen. Um, and I've really noticed the um, extremity of the denial playbook that exists online right now, and that's not to say that a huge number of people subscribe to it, but rather that there's a very committed group of and very loud group of people online who will use the same tactics to repeatedly um, uh, deny the reality of what's going on. Um, and I think of, for example, in the kind of first weeks of uh, the war in Gaza, um, tactics that were used uh, to deny both the violence committed against 
um, Israeli people by, by Hamas on October the 7th, and then also the violence committed against um, Palestinian people by Israeli forces. Um, there was one story I investigated involving two young uh, four-year-old boys, one called Omar, who was Palestinian, and one called Omer, who uh, was Israeli. Both were um, both were killed, and yet their deaths were denied online. It was suggested that they were actors, they were dolls, it never really happened. And those kinds of tropes in that playbook, it, it's one I see deployed all the time now whenever anything happens. It could be someone going missing, it could be, um, uh, it could be during war, or it could be during a general election. Um, and uh, this election, I have been keeping myself very busy, and I thought perhaps, given that I'm not there in person, it might be helpful to talk a little bit about what I found this election and perhaps how that relates to the theme of, of, of what we're discussing around language in particular and the other tactics that are used, not just language, I guess, to spread um, uh, disinformation or hate. Um, so uh, this election, I've been running... Uh, 24 old mobile phones, which sounds suitably bonkers and is suitably bonkers. Uh, they're called my undercover voters. So they're 24 fictional characters based on uh, data from an analysis by the National Centre for Social Research. And these 24 fictional characters are based across the UK. They are virtually located in eight different battleground constituencies and they have social media profiles across all of the main sites. Um, so that's TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube and X, which we used to call Twitter. And what these profiles allow me to do is to investigate and interrogate what different people are being recommended and targeted with on their feeds. Because each of us inhabit, um, certainly if you use social media, a very subjective world um, uh, on our phones that, that other people, including um, investigative reporters like me, don't always have access to. And it's important to understand how that online world is unfolding um, and particularly the impact it could have on weather and how people vote and our kind of democratic processes. Um, so I set up these undercover voters. They're private and they don't have any friends, so they're not um, uh, deceiving anyone um, in that way. Instead, they're very much kind of investigative tool rather than a polling device. Um, and I think well, some of the things that I've really found over the past few weeks and the first would be um, thinking about algorithms the computer generated systems that recommend us content the way that they can shape and affect our kind of experience of an election and you know there's a mainstream political commentary that's unfolding and um, with the kinds of uh, online influencers who you might uh, know quite well you might listen to their podcast or you might um, follow lots of their work but actually a lot of people are engaging with the election not in that way but rather kind of through their social media feeds muddled up with all kinds of other stuff they're being pushed and recommended and I've spent quite a lot of time looking at what younger people are being pushed and targeted with particularly on uh, their TikTok feeds but also on Instagram reels on X and so on um, and I think there's been a real change this election in terms of the way that the social media platforms work and therefore the kinds of content that people are being pushed so um, uh, before um, the way that the algorithms worked meant that you weren't necessarily constantly seeing content that comes from people you don't know. Now, because of the way TikTok works and the impact that's had on other platforms, you are recommended content often from people you don't follow, you've not even shown an interest in before, or perhaps you've shown an interest in the topics they're talking about, but you've not encountered their profiles. And that means that people can go viral overnight. It means that content um, which uh, doesn't necessarily have to be kind of regulated or scrutinized in any way can um, reach millions and millions of people very quickly. Often that's reliable, it's opinions, it's people getting involved, but at times it can also be misleading, uh, uh, also kind of deep fake content and so on. Um, and so I revealed kind of quite early on in the election how younger voters were being pushed misinformation um, as well as kind of hateful comments. Um, and, and a lot of this is about the way that we all, I guess, want to take part in and make our voices heard and use language to affect um, the conversation around the election. But um, the flip side of that is that um, it is quite easy to share something that's untrue and then it passes and that's sort of that. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I think it's very important to hold the social media companies to account who are in many ways as if not more powerful than um, governments in terms of uh, what they uh, allow and decide to recommend and push on their platforms. And yet the level of scrutiny that they're subjected to is, is far less. You know, if a cabinet minister or a politician didn't do an interview with a political correspondent for a year, people would be pretty outraged. I haven't been able to interview a social media boss and not for lack of trying for m more than two years. And um, so I think that um, it, it's important that we're able to hold the companies to account in that way. Um, 
I've also been looking quite a lot at kind of AI technology and the way that um, that could be abused in this election. It was something that people were really concerned about. And, you know, when we're thinking about the topic of language, I guess, and fakery, a lot of that's about the way that um, AI technology can be abused to manipulate what people have said or to suggest they've falsely suggest they've said things they never said at all. And there was one um, uh, clip I investigated, it showed uh, the Labour politician was streeting on the BBC programme Politics Live and it falsely suggested that he had called Diane Abbott a silly woman. That never happened, but uh, the clip reached hundreds of thousands of people and it wasn't just the clip itself, but actually the network of accounts that shared this clip were then all contributing and doubling down in the comments, falsely suggesting that actually um, this had happened. So there was one account that pretended to be someone who'd been working on the BBC program um, and uh, falsely suggested that they'd seen this really happen and that, that it had occurred when it hadn't. And there were other accounts doing the same thing. Um, the network and group of accounts involved in this hadn't just targeted West Streeting, they'd also shared um, faked clips of a Labour candidate, Luke Akehurst, and of Keir Starmer as well, making comments about the war in Gaza, which, which they hadn't made, um, and also clips that were kind of more obviously satirical of Reform UK leader Nigel Farage. Um, and this group, and I contacted quite a few of the accounts who were coordinating with one another about what they were posting, seemingly on a Discord server which is a bit like a mix between um, a whatsapp group and a facebook group um, where you can message and share comments and ideas or a bit like reddit uh, messaging board as well and um, uh, one of the things that was really interesting speaking to them in particular was that they kind of saw this as fair game um, during the election they said well you know there are politicians who i like and support and these were um, people who identified with um, kind of further left on the political spectrum and they said to me well I think it's fair game because politicians I like have been misrepresented and smeared by the media and so I'm allowed to do this um, they saw it as um, a, a tactic that was perfectly okay for them to employ um, and as a form of kind of trolling they kind of thought they were trying to wind people up the problem was is that real voters who were getting involved in the comments were confused they didn't know what was going on they found it quite tricky to work out what they could trust what they couldn't trust and that's been a bit of a theme this election rather than there being a a huge wave of AI generated content um, I've tended to see and I've found um, that there have been examples of kind of pockets of convincing AI generated content that have been distributed often by pretty committed um, political activists um, uh, but it's not necessarily uh, and, and a lot of it has been sort of satirical or parody but sometimes it goes a bit too far and people then are confused and unsure about what to trust um, and what was quite interesting with that investigation was I reached out to X which um, uh, we used to call Twitter which is owned by Elon Musk and they've not responded to a single write of reply response I've put to them in uh, since, since Elon Musk took over um, and for the very first time after I investigated this network they did get back to me, they took action on the network, they sent me a statement explaining how they don't allow pla platform manipulation, how they're invested in protecting users during an election and so on and that marked a real change in their approach and I think that tells us not just about the pressure on social media companies uh, during elections, um, but also about um, the ability of companies to choose to do stuff or not to choose, choose to do stuff and when they decide to do that and how and the impact that that can have and their ability to affect the conversation um, and yet the lack of, lack of responsibility often that, 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 is, that they are forced to take. Um, another topic that I've looked at quite extensively and again kind of comes down to this question of manipulation of uh, the online conversation is about bots. Um, so lots of people have been accusing other accounts this election of being bots, inauthentic, uh, automated accounts, although the term bot has almost come to just refer to any account that's um, uh, inauthentic or fake, even if it's not automated. Um, and lots of people have been accusing yeah, others of being bots. That's particularly because of um, what unfolded uh, in 2016, especially in terms of allegations and accusations of foreign interference operations run particularly by Russia in order to distort the online conversation or um, sow seeds of discord and disruption. Um, it now means that kind of everyone thinks every, everyone else could possibly be a bot and that's kind of part of the art of this really. It's almost as though inference operations don't really have to exist anymore because we all kind of think everyone and everything could be a part of them. Um, and in particular I looked into allegations that there are reform bots. Um, so these accusations weren't being leveled at other political parties but lots of people were accusing users who were repeatedly posting very Reform UK of being bots or inauthentic accounts. Um, I messaged dozens and dozens of these accounts and analysed them, looked for clues. Some of them did have hallmarks of 
inauthentic accounts, whether that's repeatedly sharing divisive content and they've never shared stuff before, unusual activity, uh, a lack of any identifying details at all, or um, you know, reusing somebody else's image and so on. Um, some of these accounts did turn out to be real people um, who told me that they're feeling frustrated about politics right now um, and that they've decided they want to vote reform and they want to get involved in the online conversation in that way. Um, but some of these uh, accounts were also um, people who uh, didn't did not get back to me or were not able to kind of prove it, pr prove that they were authentic in any way and were subsequently removed by several of the social media companies for um, engaging in, in inauthentic behavior and I think what's really important to understand particularly as we kind of approach polling day is the way that um, and perhaps the word influence operation is is uh, the, the word influence in influence operation is, is the wrong choice because in some ways it, it's very hard to prove what influence these kinds of networks could have um, in general um, and also uh, and so interference might, might be the better word. Um, uh, but, but also I think it's important for people to understand that a lot of this stuff is 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 quite complicated and quite messy and it's um, people in their bedrooms as much as it's also suspect accounts and um, with regards to the reform bots I reached out to Reform UK who told me that they've been in touch with the social media companies because as well as um, the organic growth that they were really delighted about online they'd seen this real um, uh, change in they'd seen, they'd seen several accounts that they felt were trying to manipulate the conversation and um, were posting content um, under kind of false pretense or pretending to be related to the party and, and they'd reached out to the companies about their, their concerns regarding this too um, and I think sometimes um, if there's not a kind of slam dunk oh right this group of accounts are being run by this nation or this group of people um, people kind of switch off from it whereas actually I think it's really good to be alive to and, and um, aware of the way that um, accounts who are kind of unidentified can affect the way that we're um, perceiving the election I think particularly with regards to the comments now a lot of younger users will rely on the comments I certainly do to kind of figure out what other people think, to assess kind of other people's reaction to particular posts or videos, um, and so the ability to kind of distort our perception of, of um, either popularity for one kind of party or um, just um, the kind of rhetoric and narrative around a party um, it is kind of is something that's interesting and important to pay attention to. Um, and, and I would say kind of coming to that question of, um, and I, I definitely can't answer this until um, after Thursday, uh, this coming Thursday, but um, I think probably that it's impossible to answer ever, which is the question of to what extent does social media and can social media affect whether and how people vote? Um, and I think that, that one of the things that's quite complicated about the world I investigate is that proving a kind of direct, some of what I investigate um, does have a very obvious real world consequence. And I'm thinking particularly of people whose stories I've investigated and told for podcasts or BBC Panorama who've been very seriously harmed by the worst kinds of um, uh, online abuse, trolling, conspiracy theories. Um, but, but on the whole, to, to kind of demonstrate the impact that social media has on our online conversation and on, the, on our democratic processes is, is quite difficult. And actually, a lot of this isn't about one single bit of content that changes someone's mind, but rather a pattern of um, particular posts or videos or stuff that you are recommended um, that could build up a view of maybe one particular candidate or party that could change and affect how you vote. And if that's based on good and reliable uh, information, on facts, on um, you know, valid opinion, then that's great. If it's based on stuff that's misleading or false or untrue, then, uh, then that's a problem um, and kind of uh, means that we're not, being, we're not able to make up our minds about who we want to vote for on the basis of good and reliable information. Um, so I think kind of going into polling week, I've been thinking quite a lot about that. And, and I should mention as well, um, you know, doing all these kinds of investigations uh, make me a bit of a lightning rod for the trolls and all sorts of, of hate and abuse. Um, and, you know, I've, I certainly have come to see hate and hate here is referring to, you know, death threats, really extreme online abuse, not just valid criticism, which I'm always open to. Um, uh, I've come to see hate as a um, very effective kind of weapon of this online world. It's a tactic that's deployed to target people, to silence them, often to deter them, in my case, the kinds of investigations that I'm working on or, or doing. Um, and I think it's important that we kind of see it in that way. And the ability of language, I was thinking about um, the way that I look at hate now and, and, and how, um, you know, really abusive language in particular, and once you start to see it as a kind of tool that's being used to target you, it's often very 
impersonal, although for me it often focuses on me being a woman or my age or kind of who I am, but it's not really about me at all. It's about kind of, um, you know, the, the, the shock troops of this online world and the way that they can target people in, and use them to kind of distort the perception of what's really going on. And, and you know, one of the key lessons I've learned from running around to cover voters is just how polarized the kind of online worlds we all inhabit can be even when we don't sort of recognize or, or realize it um, and that's dangerous because it means that we're inclined to share things that um, agree with our own biases perhaps even more so than, than before when we were relying solely on on the media and otherwise um, and it means that kind of going into um, going into the election this week I think it's just really important to be always super aware of what you're being recommended and targeted with and what you're seeing and particularly if it plays into um, something you might be feeling in terms of your anger or distrust or emotions or excitement um, so that that would kind of be my uh, be my sort of top tip as as, as the week ahead approaches um, and I think that um, I think that this election one of the main lessons I'll take away, um, and I, I say this with, again, several days to go, so I'm a bit of hostage to fortune and even trying to get some kind of, uh, some kind of conclusion about, about, uh, about this, but I think it speaks to, to something wider, um, which is that um, there's a lot, none of this, there's a lot of concern about abusive technology, and actually a lot of this boils down to the way that individual people choose to behave, and then also the decisions made by social media companies, ultimately made by people too. And so I was talking to somebody yesterday, and, and um, I was kind of thinking about what I've learned this election, and I would say overall it's that the problem isn't AI, it's us. <laughs> and I think it's us in terms of the way that we behave online, and the tactics that are used, and the tactics we see as fair game, but it's also us in terms of you know the way that our social media companies work and, and the impact that can have on our societies and the lack of accountability and the lack of transparency and the difficulty in 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 holding those companies to account um, and i think going forward and particularly thinking ahead to the u.s election and there have obviously been lots of other elections this year in india for example and all over the world um, i think we have to kind of increasingly think about the not the kind of single not that there's a kind of immediate effect of the online world um, uh, in terms of, right, okay, I've seen this post and I'm not going to vote for this candidate or I am going to vote for this candidate, but rather two things. First, the ability of algorithms and what's on our social media feeds to shape our perception of um, society and politics in a way that can be sort of misleading or that is led by what provokes a reaction and outrage rather than what, what's true and what's worth us knowing. Um, and I think as well, um, the, the kind of real world impact of this in terms of the ability of what's shared online, particularly in an election, to stoke kind of hate and anger and real world violence and harm, which is something I've seen a lot kind of investigating this area. Um, and it's certainly something that I sort of worry about in the, in, in the weeks and months um, ahead. Um, so thank you so much for my listening to my rather rambly, um, my rather rambly explanation of my undercover voters and what I found this election on very little sleep. <laughs> but I really appreciate you uh, coming and listening, and um, and that I'm really happy that I was able to join uh, here on Microsoft Teams. <laughs> thank you so much. anyone has any questions for either of us and there is a roving microphone which uh, is over there so hi my questions for mariana i read um with the undercover voters she found that particularly for people under 30 they were mainly uh finding on their social media feeds things which weren't prepaid for adverts or necessarily from uh, parties, but from homegrown accounts or political activists. And I wondered if you had any thoughts on what this potentially means over the next few years and for the next election about the role of political uh, influencers. Oh, I'm not sure. I, was that question for me? I don't think I quite heard it. I might need you to repeat that um, um, if that's all right. Yeah, sorry, my question was about um, people under the age of like roughly 30, mainly finding on their social media things, uh, 
things which weren't prepaid for adverts or some parties, but uh, some homegrown accounts or political influences. And I wondered if you had any thoughts on the role of political influences over the next few years and potentially into the next election. Thank you. That's right. Thank you so much. I'm so sorry. I can't actually see any of you. So while I was talking, I was just staring at a wall. <laughs> it's a real experience. Um, thank you so much. That's a really good question. Um, so very conveniently, and one of the reasons why I'm not there in person is because I had um, a report I did that came out yesterday that was all about this kind of concept of accidental influences, the people who um, either quite deliberately or accidentally go uh, viral and their content can have an impact on the election discourse. And I think it's a really important point that I've really noticed the decline in influence, I would say, of, or the decline in reach, rather, particularly because the influence is hard to prove, of um, paid for political content um, versus what we perceive as kind of organic and native content, like stuff that feels as though it would naturally come up on your social media feed and therefore it um, is the kind of things that particularly younger audiences, I think, are very receptive to because they're used to seeing it and we're kind of all a bit savvy to, well, it's a sponsored ad, I don't know if I can, you know, well, they're just telling me this because they've paid to tell me it and so on. So I think that that kind of, the um, the point you're getting at in terms of the impact of influencer culture, particularly on sort of like the, the political discourse and like political events is actually a really big deal. And I think it, it changes a lot of how we will kind of get our information, I think, um, particularly in terms of, um, uh, particularly in terms of the ability to um, uh, just not, the, you know, the, the decline perhaps of faceless, um, uh, whether it's faceless adverts or even kind of like faceless media organisations and the rise of real people that we feel as though we're having a conversation with and we can say, oh, right, I'm interested in their take and what they have to say. The problem is, obviously, kind of as I identified yesterday, that a lot of this is not subject to, in the same way the media is, kind of regulation um, and certainly kind of can't be held accountable when you say or do something that's completely false or not, or not right. So in the report yesterday, there was a... Um, uh, an image of Keir Starmer wearing a white t-shirt, it had been doctored to show him wearing a white t-shirt with a Palestinian uh, flag on it, um, and one of these uh, political influencers had shared it, kind of saying, oh, what's this? Um, and there's kind of no accountability for that, it goes viral and that's that. Um, so I think absolutely that kind of influence of culture and the way that we rely on individual accounts and real people could um, can, can affect and will affect the way that we all kind of live through elections going forward. Um, and my main kind of bit of advice to any political campaign would be that um, I feel like spending lots of money on lots of ads is probably a massive waste of money when it's a lot easier to go viral with real people and relying on uh, your relationship with influencers. Uh, question. Um, there's a lot of fact checking going on in different media in this country and others, and you're part of that fact checking. But people can make an outrageous statement on uh, in a political campaign or whatever. The fact checkers come in and say, no, that's not true. It, have, has any analysis been done as to how, how effective the fact checking is against the original outrageous statement? Yeah, really good question. Thank you. Um, um, yes, I think that it's very interesting. I mean, one of my, so there's, there's been kind of a fair bit of research looking at um, to what extent fact-checking succeeds. And certainly, I know at the BBC, we do quite a lot of your audience research on these kinds of issues as well. Um, to what extent fact-checking reaches the audiences who would benefit from the fact-checking as well? I think one of the problems often with fact-checking is that um, the fact-checking does not go nearly as far as the kind of outrageous thing that was said in the first place, but also often that the fact-checking it reaches a, a, an audience or people who otherwise are pretty receptive to it and probably are seeking it out. Um, and it's one of the reasons why I'm a kind of really big advocate of um, humanising and bringing to life these kinds of stories. I think fact-checking often on its own is not enough. And so a lot of it is about actually exposing the impact of like, right, this thing is wrong, and here's why it matters that this politician has said this thing that's wrong, or certainly in my case around public social media, here's why it matters that, you know, this particular video was faked and the impact it had and, and so on. And we tend to find, certainly I find with, with the journalism I do, that um, a really broad range of audiences, particularly younger audiences, but, but a whole mixture of people are really receptive to understanding why they should care about it. I think otherwise sometimes it can feel a little bit like, oh, well, politicians lie all the time and they've said something that, 
um, is wrong again and why should I care? And I think that's a really kind of crucial thing to think about, particularly as we head into the American election as well. And there are kind of quite a lot of lessons learned from um, previous elections and what worked in terms of fact checking and what didn't. Um, I work with a great team at the BBC, BBC Verify, who are a mixture of um, either someone like me who does sort of social media investigations or, you know, great um, analysts and fact checkers um, and other people. And I think you need a kind of combination of all of those things, but done in a way that really and um, certainly for me, kind of brings it to life, exposes the real-world consequences, humanises it, it uh, attracts in a whole range of audiences. So people go, oh, OK, here's why I should care about it, rather than just, oh, yeah, it's telling me the thing that I sort of already thought I knew, or I don't really care because I know that people, politicians, don't tell the truth. Not that they all don't, but you know what I mean. <laughs> Uh, I'm just following up on that point, you know, in the recent uh, debate in the U.S., if you call it a debate, uh, there, there uh, one fact checker said that uh, uh, one candidate lied 10 times, and that same fact checker said the other candidate lied 30 times uh, in the debate. And my question to you, is, as you were alluding to, is in a situation where fact checkers are pointing out this guy's lying 10 times, the other guy's lying 30 times, can't that lead to voter apathy where they conclude, well, they're all lying, so what difference does it make? They're all lying anyway. And therefore, what do you think are the pros and cons of fact checking? Yeah, I think that I think that's a really important point because um, I think that certainly I find and I have a lot of people, um, you know, people who watch and read and listen to my stuff who get in touch with me about this sort of thing and kind of say, well, you know, it's kind of like, well, I, I sort of expect them to not tell the truth anymore and they say things and I don't really believe them and it doesn't really matter. And that's, that's quite depressing in some ways because it feels as though, you know, um, uh, I, I often talk about this, um, but you know, we all rely on this kind of shared concept of, of, of reality for democracy to exist, and certainly a kind of uh, an agreement on what's true and what isn't. Um, and it becomes quite difficult when everyone's kind of operating within their own <laughs> versions of that reality. Um, I think that I would kind of echo what I said to the to, to the to the last question, which is that. Um, I think that it's really important to kind of explain to people why it matters if someone has said something that's not true. So, I mean, particularly thinking about the kind of real world impact of what they're saying, like if they've said something that they could then result in something bad happening or they've said something that actually it's like, right, here's why it matters that this person didn't tell you the truth. Um, I thought it was quite interesting yesterday. I, I was um, I was on the 10 o'clock news and as I was sitting uh, back but not backstage, you don't call it backstage, in the green room uh, before I went on, I was watching Sarah Smith, the BBC uh uh, US editor and um, uh, one of my colleagues from America asked this package and she played several clips of um, Donald Trump in particular and said uh, and then just said these were all lies like this, this all wasn't true and I thought that was quite an interesting approach to kind of saying look lots of these things weren't true um, and sometimes I think it is about sort of saying right lots of these things weren't true but let me tell you about the ones that really matter that we understand they're not true. And um, because I do think that there is a kind of exhaustion, certainly from the audience, that, well, I don't really know what to trust anymore. Um, and part of it, I think, is kind of, and I believe in this quite a lot, but the kind of social media literacy element, or not just the social media literacy, but the kind of general media literacy um, in terms of equipping. Um, viewers or listeners or readers with the skills to be able to spot this stuff and kind of like interrogate it themselves and look into it as well because we find again that that's something people are really receptive to and they like feeling like they actually have some agency and are able to sort of like look into stuff as well as obviously us doing our jobs and and helping them with that if that makes sense. Okay yeah there's time for just one last question so the mic's coming down down here. Thanks, uh, Mariana. Um, so I, my question is about levels of uh, truth and fact. So, uh, you know, I, I'm British, but I live in America. And uh, during the, you know, COVID time and discussing vaccines with people, there was this sort of, <laughs> sort of wall, essentially. You'd say, well, you know, uh, vaccines work. Well, no, they don't. Um, you know, it's scientifically proven. No, you, I don't trust scientists. And it literally was the deeper you went, it didn't matter. Oh, that's mainstream media. Um, you know, it's big pharma. So in other words, this whole concept of truth and fact, I just wondered how you address uh, the fact that there's uh, millions of people for whom their, you know, relationship to truth and fact and what they trust is, is literally in a different universe to what, you know, 
someone else may think is their truth and what they trust and what is a fact for them. So how do you deal with this divide? Yeah, that's a really good question. Thank you. Um, I spend <laughs> far too much of my time dealing with that divide. Um, I think that um, uh, one of the things I often say, and, and um, so I've, I've written a book which is out this year called Among the Trolls, My Journey Through Conspiracy Land. And in that, I talk quite a lot about um, a group of people who I'd class as the true believers, who I think are the kinds of people you're talking about, which is people who genuinely become so convinced of particular conspiracy theories, no amount of evidence, no amount of um, discussion is going to convince them otherwise. And they have decided, for example, that the vaccine was part of a plot to kill millions of people, or that COVID-19 was a complete hoax and it was all staged and no one was, no one died and so on. Um, and there are very valid concerns and questions that people have about, for example, uh, big pharmaceutical companies and vaccines and you know uh, uh, proportionate lockdown measures and so on. But these are the people who've gone much further than that, often starting with those legitimate worries and then find themselves very deep down what we often call the rabbit hole. And I tend to find that the most useful thing, particularly when you're um, interviewing or talking to them, is to actually go in with that really inquisitive approach. And that's not to say that you're not holding them to account, particularly if they're saying something that is completely untrue or, or harmful in some way, um, but rather that you understand why why they believe what they believe and I often think the why they believe what they believe is much more interesting than the what because there's no amount like I say of evidence that's going to change their mind and it's not my job to change their mind either it's my job to kind of better understand why this is happening and the impact it's had but if I can ask someone questions that will um, um, you know expose right, oh, hang on, this is actually the legitimate kind of wrongdoing that's led them to this point. They actually feel really let down for this reason, or, oh, hang on, the way they're using social media has led to this point, or they feel as though, you know, they're being, often being kind of conned or misled by um, other online influencers who are profiting from them, maybe they're making money, growing a following, and so on. Um, I find those the most useful paths, um, and there's quite a lot of people I've chatted to who have managed to escape what we call the conspiracy theory rabbit hole, and they all kind of agree that a lot of it is about kind of sustained conversations with the people in their lives, um, and a lot of it is, I think like you identified there, about trying to repair that um, trying to deal with d distrust, the problem of distrust and repair that relationship. Um, and I like to think and hope that if you kind of really show people your workings and take them with you as you investigate and expose stuff, they are more inclined to believe you and they see you as a real person and they trust what you're saying. Um, but, you know, there's a huge barrier. And, and I say that as someone who works at the BBC and a lot of these people think that the BBC is the worst thing that's ever happened ever and um, that we're a huge part of the problem. So it becomes quite difficult to have a conversation sometimes. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't have it. And that's why I'm quite a strong advocate um, of really applying sort of an empathetic approach as well as an investigative one to this sort of area. Okay, right. Thank you very much, Mariana. That was that was great. And thank you everyone for being such a great audience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.